All right, 312.8 enclosures with switches and overcurrent devices. Small change here, the allowances for power monitoring equipment were expanded to include energy management equipment and their requirements were expanded as well. So covering more than just the change, because 312.8 is a pretty small section, so let's look at the whole thing. It starts out by saying that the wiring space in enclosures for switches and overcurrent devices may contain other wiring and equipment in accordance with 312.8 A and B. So we're in Article 312, which is cabinets, cutout boxes, and meter socket enclosures. And a lot of people get confused on what that is. So a meter socket enclosure that's pretty self-explanatory. That's the enclosure that a meter goes in, like a utility meter. Uh, a cutout box is really just what it sounds like. It's a box where you cut out the power. So it's like it's, it's a switch enclosure. So when you have a fused switch, you install that in a cutout box. And then a cabinet is what we're looking at here in the photograph. That is a panel board mounted in a cabinet. So the cabinet's the enclosure. The panel board is actually just the guts, the bus bars. So the wiring spaces in enclosures for switches and overcurrent devices can contain other stuff in accordance with A and B. A talks about splices, taps, and feed through conductors. So the wiring space in enclosures can contain conductors that feed through or are spliced or are tapped as indicated in A1, 2, and 3. All right, so starting with A1, what a gorgeous panel, huh? The total area of conductors in any cross-section of the enclosure must not exceed 40% of that cross-sectional area. Now, you may think you've seen some ugly panels, and perhaps you have. I, I certainly have as well. But I'll tell you right now, regardless of how ugly your panel was, uh, you did not see a violation of this section. I, I seriously, and I'm not kidding when I say this, I don't think that you could actually violate this section. I, I, I mean that. I think it's impossible. Uh, and maybe some of you are, are you know, don't get me wrong, it, it's not a challenge. <laughs> you know, I'm not telling you to go out and try to prove me wrong, but I am saying that I don't think it's possible because I, I've done the math and it, it's very surprising. But let's take a look. How many, let's, let's say that the, that the wiring space here is three inches by three inches, okay? And let's just pretend that all of these are 12 gauge wire. How many 12 gauge wires could you put in that area before violating this section? Well, you know me, I'm kind of a, a geek, so I went ahead and did the math. The answer is 270, <laughs> all right? You're not going to violate this section. Even if you wake up and say, you know what, I'm going to violate 312.8 A1 today. No, you're not. It's not going to happen. So there's the math. If you're interested in looking at it, that's the rule. So splice as much as you want in a cabinet that contains a panel board. You're not going to violate this rule. A2, the total area of conductors and splices and taps must not exceed 75% of the cross-sectional area of the space in which they're installed. Okay, so let's go back one slide here. This is saying that you're not allowed to exceed 40% fill for conductors. This is saying conductors plus the splicing equipment, so the twist-on wire connectors, the push-in wire connectors. All of those plus the conductors is not allowed to exceed 75% fill. There is no way you're going to violate that. We saw, we, we saw what 40% fill is. That's 270 12 gauge wires in a 3 inch by 3 inch space. There's no way you're going to violate 75%. Item 3 was added, I think, back in 2011, and I think this is a good rule. If an enclosure contains feed-through conductors, a warning label that complies with the warning label rules in 110.21b must be applied to indicate the closest disconnecting means for them. Looks like i got a typo in my slide here I'll address. So the idea is this. If, let's say this breaker is a main breaker panel board. If I walk up to it and I shut off the main breaker, everything in that enclosure should be de-energized. And if that doesn't happen, that's okay, just let me know. Alright, so if I shut off this, this panel, 
everything in the cabinet should be off. Or I should at least be made aware of that fact. So here it says, warning, panel contains feed-through conductors. They're fed from panel 7H, circuit number 3. So there you go. Tells me how to shut them off. Now here's some language that we added uh, back in 2017, I think, for power monitoring equipment and now energy management equipment as well. So this is subsection B and it says power monitoring or energy management equipment is also allowed in enclosures as follows. And this is some uh, power monitoring equipment. This one happens to be the wiser uh, piece of equipment offered by Square D. Very interesting piece of equipment. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to allow myself to go on a little tangent here if you don't mind. This is a very cool piece of equipment. You install this in your panel and uh, it's got a couple of CTs. You can see right here and here these, these wires go off and they just wrap around the feeders. Not the individual branch circuits, surprisingly, but just the feeders. And you get an app for your cell phone and you sync it up and this thing pretty much tells you anything you want to know about what's happening in your house. And I mean pretty much anything. Uh, if you would like to have an alarm that goes off when your son's PlayStation turns on at 1 o'clock in the morning, you can get a text message. It'll do that. It'll tell you exactly how much solder you're creating, how much power you're using, if your air conditioner turns on. Um, it'll tell you if you left the house and you forgot that the, the, the range is on. Um, you could program it. You know, maybe you want to, maybe you want to keep check up on, on your dad. You know, maybe, you're, maybe your dad's elderly and he lives by himself and you know, you're not trying to spy on him, but you know that every day <clears throat> he wakes up at 6 a.m. and starts the coffee pot. You know, you could put one of these on his house and just, you know, have it let you know that dad did get some coffee this morning. So he's on the right side of the dirt, <laughs> you know. But what's interesting is if you're a manufacturer of appliances, you're going to plug your equipment in when you manufacture it and you're going to shoot the sine wave on an oscilloscope. And then you're going to send a photograph of your sine wave to Square D and to Eaton and to GE and Siemens and everybody else because you want to make sure that their AFCIs don't trip when they see your sine wave. So now all these manufacturers have this massive library of sine waves. And a Sony PlayStation has a sine wave that looks exactly like this. And the Samsung uh, LCD TV that's 55 inch, it looks exactly like that. So what this piece of equipment does is it reads the sine wave of all your different pieces of equipment and it knows exactly what you have in your house. And you can tell it to let you aware of anything that you want to know about. So very cool piece of equipment. I'm not trying to advertise Square D stuff. I just, you know, I think it's an interesting piece of equipment. So I talk about it when I can. So can you put this thing inside of a cabinet? Absolutely. Perfectly fine. Not a problem. What are the rules for it? Well, the equipment must be a field installable accessory for listed equipment or a listed kit for field installation. All right, well, same device. And you can see here it is, in fact, listed. This happens to be listed by Intertech. Good enough. So there you go. It's a listed piece of equipment. Put it in your cabinet. Not a problem. What's the rules for it? Well, the total area of all conductors, splices, taps, and equipment must not exceed 75% of the cross-sectional area that they're installed in. Now, here you could see where you potentially could have a violation. I mean, this takes up a lot more space than a twist-on wire connector. So, if you're not careful, uh, you could potentially violate this rule, although it'd still be pretty difficult. So, you know, don't get crazy about it. I want to point out one more thing while we're looking at this. Look at all these different marks that you have on here. Let's go over these really quick. The first one here, I've got the CE mark. That is for use in Europe. It means nothing to us. That Whether that mark is there or not there changes nothing. Here I've got a mark that says CSA, which means that this is uh, listed by the Canadian Standards Association. You can use it in Canada. You're good to go. Then I've got the backwards UR right here. And the backwards UR is a UL mark, but it's not a listing mark. It's a certified, a recognized component mark. So the only person that can, uh, the only place where you could use this specific piece of equipment 
is in conjunction with a listed assembly. So in other words, if I just bought this little CT, that's not listed. It's listed when it's part of a listed assembly. So this plus this is a listed assembly. So be careful when you see things with the backwards you are. It's not a listing mark. It's a, it's a recognized component. It's something that manufacturers uh, find worthwhile. Item three, <clears throat> control and instrumentation conductors, and this is new, must comply with 725.49 for class one conductors, and, and really that's easy enough. So basically, uh, if it's class one, and it's usually not going to be, then they have to be 600 volt rated, they have to be THHN, THWN, what have you. Or B, if it's smaller than 18 gauge, like the ones here in the picture, but not smaller than 22 gauge for individual conductors or 26 gauge for a cable, then they have to meet these rules. One through three, they must be routed along the perimeter, secured at 10 inch maximum spacings and within 10 inches of terminations and prevent contact with other components. So here I've just kind of thrown these things down here in the corner of the panel. That would be a violation. I need to, I need to route them around the perimeter. I need to secure them at 10 inches. So maybe get the little cable ties that have the, the sticky backs on there so that you can secure them. And then on items five, four and five, they have to be rated for the system voltage but at least 600 volts, and they have to be rated 90 degrees C. Makes sense. You can't have 150 volt rated wires in there just in case they fault it up uh, to one of the other conductors. We don't want it to just completely blow up. We want to make sure that it can survive long enough to initiate an overcurrent device and stop the short circuit. If you're interested, you can go to iectraining.com for the book that this is based on or the slides which are going to have available uh, within the next few days actually. Today is November 5th, 2019. The PowerPoint should be up here in just a couple of days for purchase if you're an instructor and you want to use that. If you're interested, my name is Ryan Jackson. Ryan Jackson Electrical Training, ryanjacksonelectrical.com. There's my email address, ryanjackson618 at gmail.com. Thanks, everybody. Have a great day.